1834, is greeted by Stalin in gross self-acclamation as the Congress of Victors. The delegates to the Congress are assembled. Stalin now considers their loyalty. At this Congress, in which adulation of Stalin reaches new heights, the young Khrushchev. No shadow of his vigorous denunciation of Stalin a quarter of a century later crosses his face. He is one of the up-and-coming princelings of the party. Lavrenti Beria, too, the monstrous hangman who will serve Stalin in later years, is edging onto the national stage at this Congress. The best known are the much photographed stars of the party, filmed, praised and promoted by the press like a Clark Gable or a Cary Grant. They are men with nothing less than film star status. Prominent among them is Sergei Kirov, a rising party star, a member of the Politburo, tough, ruthless with the lives of others, but perpetually smiling, energetic, popular. In speech after speech, the Georgian or Johnny Kitsa and the flatterer Voroshilov he preys on Stalin as a helmsman of genius. But among a core group of regional party secretaries with first-hand experience of the costs of Stalin's achievements, the adulation is a mask. Among the many public votes taken, on the last day, delegates are given the opportunity in secret ballot to vote for members of the Central Committee and, of course, confirm Stalin as General Secretary. It is a formality acceded to by the smiling, indulgent Stalin. There have been so many formal ballots, but nobody could have predicted the dramatic result this one was to have. Now, only hours before Congress breaks up, the votes are counted. Kirov has just three votes against him. But, almost unbelievably, 300 delegates have voted against Stalin. It confirms the Georgian in all his worst fears, his nightmares of treachery. The papers are immediately destroyed and the results falsified. Stalin is now shown to have been all but unanimously elected, but the fate of the delegates and Sergei Kirov himself is sealed. Of those 1,966 delegates, over a thousand will be murdered as a new terror sweeps through the administration. Few of the leading figures are spared, and for them it will be no more than a temporary stay of execution. Of the 139 member Central Committee elected by the Congress of Victors, 98 men will be taken out and shot dead. Thus far has Stalin brought the Marxist-Leninist dream in one short decade. And now he must face the problem of the popularity of Kirov. And for a solution, Joseph Stalin looks towards Germany. Like Stalin's problems with the popular Sergei Kirov, Hitler has similar problems with his old friend Ernst Röhm. Swashbuckling, populist leader of the brown shirt thugs who won the streets for Hitler, Röhm is now an embarrassment. In one devastating night, the night of the long knives, Hitler strikes. Chancellor of the German state, he personally murders Röhm in a Munich cell. Conducted by Himmler's brilliant assistant, Reinhard Heydrich, the night of the long knives is a clean surgical operation. In unspoken homage to the German dictator six months later, Stalin strikes in Leningrad on his own Night of the Long Knives. On December the 1st, 1934, Kirov falls to a bullet from an NKVD assassin. This was an act of terrorism. One of our state leaders was murdered. A very popular person who was loved by everybody. A magnificent public speaker. Everyone was charmed by him. And then suddenly he was murdered. How and why could he have been killed? Well, when someone telephoned Bukhari and told him about it, 
He just put down the phone and said, now Cobra will shoot us all. At Kirov's funeral, Stalin behaves like a man bereft of his best friend. But it is the beginning of countless arrests of party members. Everybody who had been involved with Kirov, including his assassin, is to die in faked accidents. In Leningrad, the terror is intense. Throughout the country, many thousands of others unconnected with Kirov are arrested. The pressure is relentlessly maintained. The aim now is no less than a complete scouring of the party for anybody whose loyalty is in doubt. This is a time when Nikolai Yezhov serves as Stalin's hangman, a time which is to become known as the Yezhovshina, the days of Yezhov the dwarf. Mass demonstrations are organized to call for the punishment of those guilty of Kirov's death. Zinoviev and Kamenev Stalin's old comrades of the early Soviet days confessed to plots to combine with Trotsky to murder the Soviet leader. The trials continue. Bukharin, whom Stalin has stalked for 10 years, is dragged before the court. It was a pretense, a tragic farce. He was interrupted several times by Vyshinsky, very rudely, like, why do you keep telling us all these fairy tales? Keep to the subject. Eventually, he interrupted Bukharin, shouting, you are a cross between a fox and a pig, and didn't even give him the opportunity to finish what he was saying. Stalin was supremely suspicious. He'd been afraid of assassination attempts all his life, although there hadn't been one genuine attempt as yet. For example, wherever he went, he had half a meter cut from the bottom of the curtains, so that he could be sure no one was hiding behind them. And of course, this was almost laughable. Every time he went to his dacha, he always chose the way himself from two or three possible routes just before leaving. He used to do this in spite of the fact that the route from the Kremlin to Kuncival was fairly short, and the choice was therefore very limited. Another thing he used to do was to strictly forbid anyone to remove the snow from the area near the windows of his dacha. He liked to see the virgin white.